Uh, my name is Thomas Sue, and I, along with my colleague, Steve Kalkinen, lead our internal gamification community of practice on the Knowledge Exchange. You can visit us at go.accenture.com slash gamification. Now, a few quick ground rules for this session. Um, I appreciate your patience as we deal with some technology issues. Um, I think everyone's unmuted, so we won't have any background noise, which is great. Um, on the flip side, we do want the session to be interactive. So please, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and submit them in the chat, and I will keep an eye on the chat, and we'll moderate and interrupt you, Kai, if there are any questions uh, that need to be brought up. So just yeah. some context for this session. Um, our community has run a number of learning sessions in the past. Um, but I am super excited about this particular one because we've brought in one of the best gamification gurus in the world, Yukai Chow. I met Yukai at G-Summit, and I can say that he is a true pioneer in this gamification industry, having started conceptualizing and applying gamification way back in 2003, years before the, t the term was even coined. He's most famous for his Octalysis framework, which is an important piece of thinking for all of us to consider. And that's the focus of this workshop. As gamification has taken off lately, there have been many critics that point out that simply adding game mechanics or functional elements to an application don't necessarily make it fun, that you need to address the human element of what makes games engaging. And that's exactly what you guys of Talisys framework does. And from a personal perspective, his thinking has also been uh, a major factor in our own gamification designs internally within the center and how we apply this to our clients as well. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Kai. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me here. It's uh, Yukai Chow, and today we'll uh, talk through a workshop on the framework for actionable gamification. Now, usually this, this, uh, this work, we're going to be cramming a lot of information uh, in a relatively short amount of time. So um, I'll go through material fairly quickly, but feel free to ask questions and interrupt me. And Thomas will decide if it's, if it's uh, interruption worthy, and then you'll ask me. And then uh, there's a few uh, things, exercises too. I'll ask you to think about some ideas and jot things down. So if you've got pen or paper or you want to type, uh, that's great. Um, unfortunately, it's, just, it's hard to have. Uh, 250 people just chime in whenever they want, so let's do this. So first, a quick introduction. I'm Yukai Chow again. I'm your guilt leader for today. And a quick int and uh, you know, like Thomas said, I've done gamification for about 10 years. I, I'm a, a partner at the Enterprise Gamification Consultancy. I lecture at Stanford, yada, yada. Basically, I do gamification for a living. been doing it for a while. And uh, this company in the UK called Leaderboard has decided to title was one of the top gamification gurus. Cool. So let's uh, let's move into uh, gamification games. So before, let's start off with games. So when people think about gamers, like what do you think about, right? A lot of people think about these type of people, right? Kids or single guys who don't have a job and maybe, and and just eat pizza on their shirts. You know, oh, these are the gamers, right? But the actual demographics is very surprising for a lot of people. The average gamer is actually 35 years old. And 68% of those gamers are over 18 years old. And almost half of them, 47%, are women. If you consider games like Candy Crush, like Farmville, you know, Angry Birds, things like that. Which means there's actually more adult women playing games than males under 18. And if you look at this, this, these, this demographic, it's pretty much everyone, right? Just half, half female, average 35 years old. Which means that your employees your clients, you know, your people you interact with, they're all fit into the demographic of gamers. And it's not just for kids. The, the reason why people think kids is because in the early days, games, the demographic games targeted were for kids. And so they're seen as toys and they designed for kids. And we're going to talk about game design uh, a lot in this talk. Cool. So before anything, let's, let's start off with an exercise. So think about one game you enjoyed playing. Um, could be, you know, it could be Farmville, Candy Crush, social games. A lot of you played. Some of them are hardcore games. You know, uh, younger employees, Gen Y, probably will have played these before StarCraft, WoW, Dota. But even if you're a, a baby boomer, you probably have played, enjoyed playing games like poker, golf, mahjong, <laughs> crossword puzzle, Sudoku, things like that. So just think about one game that you enjoy playing. 
And then write, write that down and really think about what made that game really fun and enjoyable. Try to figure out why that game appeals to you uh, compared to all the other games that you don't really enjoy playing. And so we're going to come back to this later because we're going to lay out a framework to understand why these games are interesting. And uh, that'll be pretty useful. Cool. So what is gamification? Gamification is basically taking all these fun and exciting elements that you see in games and pouring it into important but boring things, you know, things like compliance, things like legal work, product, uh, playing with using a product, right? Things that you don't want to do but you have to. And it's merging the two worlds. And a lot of people ask, hey, do games actually motivate people? You know, does it actually have that much power? And my answer is yes. And my favorite example is that, you know, a lot of people say kids these days have no work ethics, right? They have no discipline. They can't focus on anything, right? But when it comes to games, kids have amazing work ethics. Like a lot of kids wake up 3 a.m. in the morning behind their parents' back to secretly go on their computer and love up their characters and play their RPG games and, and do whatnot. And if you've played R RPG role-playing games before, you'll also know that leveling up usually means that you're killing the exact same monsters over and over again on the exact same stage for hours and hours, and this can go on for weeks. Uh, even games like Candy Crush, right, it's mostly repetitive tasks. That's the same thing. You just keep doing it over and over and over and again. Angry Birds over and over again, right? And so in, in the gaming world, this is called grinding. It's fun and addicting. Kids will say, hey, I can't go play basketball because I have to go home and grind. Now, in the real world, this is actually called grunt work, right? If you do the same repetitive task over and over and over again for hours and hours and you continue that for weeks, that's, grind, that's grunt work. And no one likes grunt work. It's boring and torturous. So if game can get kids who, again, have no work ethics, have no discipline, to secretly wake up 3 a.m. in the morning to voluntarily do you know, grunt work behind their parents' back, risk, greeting, uh, risk being grounded, and you understand why that is, I believe that you can really uh, engage anyone to do anything. Of course, if it is well designed, which is a huge premise of this entire talk. So unfortunately, in the real world, we don't see that much engagement, right? That, that kids are, and you see that in kids too. Like besides game, they usually don't get that engaged. And you know, the joke here is the reality is the worst game ever. You know, there's there's just not that many things exciting that's going on. You don't see that much positive feedback. You know, you have to wait a lot. And why is why is reality so boring? Um, and here here's a here's a quick chart to to share some some insight about hey, what are the differences that games have that for instance works does not have, but works should have for instance, right? Tasks like like I said, games are repetitive but fun. Work, you know, it's repetitive but dull for some reason. Feedback, right? In the game, whenever you do something, within a few minutes, 10, 20 minutes, you'll see, wow, good job, you did great, or you failed, oh, sad, I need to improve. But in the workplace, sometimes the feedback is once a year, right? You're just doing stuff on a daily basis, you're not sure how you're doing, and then a year later, you figure, oh, yeah, I get a bonus or I get promoted, I don't know what happens, right? So, so not a lot of feedback. In a, the goals in a game is very clear. Save the princess, do this, defeat, jump to this next level, whatnot. Unfortunately, in the workplace, the goals are sometimes very contradictory, sometimes very vague. You know, you'll, you don't really know exactly what to do to, to win the game at work. Uh, Pass and master in the game is very clear, right? This is how you level up. This is how you improve. This is how you get promoted. And um, in the work, it's sometimes not as clear, which goes to the one below promotion, right? In a game, it's all about meritocracy. The, the gamers who have the best ability, they're the leaders. And you see situations where 30, 40 year old gamers, they would be listening to like an 11 year old because this 11 year old is the guild leader. He knows exactly what he's doing and is like, like, hey, you guys go there, you attack here, you defend, and all that stuff, right? So in the gaming world, there's no seniority, there's no, you know, I'm older, or I, I, I have this degree. It's all about, hey, if you prove that you can perform, that you're, you're a leader, or you can do the best in this game, then, you're, then you are promoted to become the leader. Whereas in the workplace, you know, there's the term kiss up, kiss up or curse <laughs> Basically, you just say, hey, sometimes if you, it's not just about how well you do your work, right? It's really about how well you can, you can do, your, do some politics, really kiss up a bit to, to people above and eventually get there. And it's just not as, as interesting for, for some people. Um, you know, and so I'm not going to go through this entire list, but you have some time to check it out. Autonomy in game, you have full autonomy. You can choose how you want to complete the game. And work, you know, there's a little bit. Um, 
And uh, one interesting thing is for failure, right? In the, in, most people, when they play games, they expect to fail. They expect to die. No one beats the Super Mario game or any game the first time they play it. And so they expect it, and they try different things, and they talk about it, right? Whereas in the workplace, it's forbidden, it's punished. Don't talk about it. And when you, when you make sure that failure does not happen, if, if failure is forbidden in any organization, then you also kill out innovation because no one wants to try new things. Right, so, so there's a lot of things that we can see here that games have, work does not have, which is why a lot of people at work are not engaged, they're not motivated. So I believe that the real term for gamification is actually human-focused design as opposed to function-focused function, function -focused design. So it's a design system that remembers people, that optimizes for motivation for everyone in the system. So most systems are function-focused. They, they, they optimize for output and efficiency. And this is like a factory, right? In a factory, you, you assume the workers in a factory will do their work, and then you just try to figure out, okay, how to maximize our output production and all that stuff. Whereas human-focused design remembers that everyone in the system have feelings, have motivations, have insecurities, have reasons why they do or do not want to do something. And it optimizes for that. So this is kind of like a theme park where you design it to be really, really fun, and then you can predict that people will automatically want to line up for hours and hours just so they can enjoy the experience. Now the reason, reason why we call it gamification is that the gaming industry is the first industry to master human-focused design because games have no other purpose than to please the human, right? You know, but yeah, they, there's sometimes a made-up purpose like, you know, killing a dragon, saving a princess, sometimes saving a dragon, right? But all of these are just made-up excuses to, to entertain the person, to engage the person. And so because games have spent decades or even centuries mastering how to do human-focused design, now we're learning from games, and that's what we call gamification. And this is very important, human-focused design. So Are you let's take it as yes. Um, just two two quick things. First of all, some folks in the chat are asking if they'll have access to the slides afterwards. Are these slides something you can share? Absolutely. Great. So we'll be sure to get these slides up later after the session. Um, there's another question asking: Is human-focused design the same or similar to human-centered design um, that Bob Gerard and Claire Norman, who are folks within Accenture and our uh, capability development group? Um, that's mm -hmm. something that they pro uh, propose or, or push for. Um, unfortunately, yeah, so, so, I'm not that so, familiar with what they're talking about. <laughs> I probably yeah. should be. Um, okay. I, I so, think so, so from, my understanding, go ahead. from my understanding, there's a lot of different other terms that sound similar, user-centric, right, human-centric, whatnot. Um, what I've seen, and I and I I wouldn't say I'm the expert in the other ones, so I wouldn't make a big judgment there on anything. But what I what I see the key difference from different similar sounding ones, a lot of them focus on usability. They focus on what's easy to do, but it does not focus on motivation. So so usability is hey, if a user wants to do something, they can do it easily, right? But human focused design in a gamification context, in my in my framework is basically what makes them want to do it, right? That, 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 that's two different things. And so, again, the theme park is fun, so people want to enjoy it. Whereas sometimes, again, for, for, for when some people say user-focused or, or human-centered design, it's more about, hey, this is intuitive, it's ergonomic, it's easy, right? So, so that would be some differences I see um, in other terms that sound similar. And of course, if the one you're referring to does completely focus on motivation, desire, then, then I'd say it's very similar. Um, and so my, my mind would just, human focus is going to be just a little different because it's powered by octalysis, but, you know, it's, it's, it's all about what would make people want to do something when they don't have to. Because games are always voluntary, right? You, you, you have to do your triple tax because you have to file for taxes. You have to go to work, but you never have to go, play any single game. So they're fighting for the right for, for you to want to do it. And I think that's, that's a big difference. Hopefully that kind of answers the question a little bit. Cool. I think it does. So, Thank you. No problem. All right, so let's uh, jump into a few quick examples um, so, we, so we make it a little more concrete. Um, one of my favorite examples of gamification is Folded. So, and, and some, uh, I think a lot of you might have heard about this one. So scientists have been uh, trying to figure out a, uh, AIDS 
protein virus problems. So, you know, scientific research trying to solve uh, for diseases. And the top PhDs in the world couldn't solve this protein structure problem for 15 years. And so they're like, hey, why don't we create a game, put it on the internet, it's a protein folding game, and see if people will solve it for us. And so again, it's a game where you're trying to manipulate the, all this protein structure and trying to do things like maximize surface space and all that stuff. And what you see there is that a this 15-year-old AIDS problem was solved in 10 days. Within 10 days, this gamer played it and was like, hey, I solved it. You know? So you can see, instantly see that impact, right? It's, it's a huge difference. It's, Something that takes a long time for 15 years versus just, hey, solving 10 days. So we see that power, the power of game making a difference. Another example is done by my colleague Mario Herger. And uh, he, he was champion gamification in SAP and has been there for about 15 years. Uh, obviously, he's probably championed for a close, more, more like five, eight years. And uh, the SAP has a, has a community called the SAP Community Network. And it's really trying to promote expertise, right? It's really trying to get people to help each other because when you have a large organization, you always know that someone in my organization is an expert at this, but you never know who that is and, you know, there's no incentive for them to share. So they added a lot of gamification elements, a, a, a reputation uh, system, status, whatnot. And what you see is that immediately, amazingly also, immediately at, 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 uh, adding this, they increased their active users by 1300%, 13x, and activity by 2300%. And we're not talking about like the startup that had 10 users and now there's like 23 users. This website had 2 million users before that. And it's, you know, obviously, SAP, they've already tried to optimize every single bit they can. And adding this gamification layer on top of, if done correctly, they instantly improve their metric by, by a tremendous amount. Another example is more in sales and marketing Autodesk. Autodesk um, makes high-quality 3D imaging software, or you know, yeah, 3D software. Uh, but their software is pretty expensive. You know, it's a few thousand dollars, two to seven thousand dollars a piece. And they they figured, hey, the best way for people to commit that money is for them to use the free trial first. So they created a game called Uncharted Territories, which and first of all, to play the game, the first thing you need to do is download the free trial. And once you once you start playing the game, it it uh, brings you into this fantasy world of, hey, pretending that you're traveling all over the world. You know, you're going to Turkey, you're going to Germany, and you're solving problems. It's like, hey, in Turkey, there's the bridge that's about to break. And, of course, to solve this problem, you need to use your Autodesk free trial to, uh, to fix the crack and do all that stuff. And, obviously, that engages a lot of people. So what we see here is that it increased trial usage by 54%, and more importantly, it increased their sales revenue by 29%. And again, when the company makes billions of dollars, you know, if you increase any metric by, you know, one, three, five percent, it's already really, really amazing. But with this example, they increased by 29%, which is another reason why uh, gamification is, uh, is, is being pretty popular these days, if done correctly. So there's a lot of these gamification case studies around. I wish I could tell you all of them, but... Uh, due to a uh, limit of time, uh, we won't be able to. So, so I've compiled a page with uh, about 90 plus gamification case studies, and all of them, I made sure all of them had ROI stats because I know those are important for executive buy-in. And I'm not, so those, those don't have the fluffy one. It just has, a, you know, this is the case study, this is the number, uh, percentage, or dollar amount that it's saved or improved. So you guys can uh, check it out, bit.ly slash game capital ROI. Cool. All right, so... Gamification is a pretty relatively new term. Um, still, a lot of companies are still saying, oh, you know, is this a fad? Why do we need to play games? You know, what is this about? You know, a lot of times I get invited to do workshops just to, just to do corporate buy-in. And so what's kind of interesting here is uh, it really fits well into the Schopenhauer truth cycle, this is the German philosopher. He says that every truth passes through three stages before it is recognized. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And then third, it is regarded as self-evident. And this is a smart guy. Yeah, so, so we see that actually in, in, in our industry in technology. Like, so let's, let's, let's go back to a history lesson, right? Many years ago, you guys might remember, every organization saying, duh, of course we need a talent strategy, right? But this website thing is kind of a fad. Like, where's the ROI in having a website, right? And who needs a website, too? It's a distraction to business. And, you know, maybe just ch fad chasing enthusiasts and conference talk about websites, right? About 15 years ago, I'd say. And then a few years ago, 
suddenly everyone says, duh, everyone organizes needs a website strategy. Like, if you don't have a website, you're not a real business, right? But the social thing is a fad. Like, where's the ROI in social stuff? Who needs social media? It's a distraction to our employees, right? And I remember that because at that time I was also um, consulting on social media. I was, I was speaking at Stanford, and again, you know, people still regard as, hey, you know, the social thing is, is just what little teenagers like to do. And, you know, there's some conferences and just people and big organizers still think, hey, just enthusiasts who, chase the, who would like to chase the wind talk about social media. And now what you see is that every organization feels like, hey, of course we need a social strategy. If you don't have a social strategy, you're irrelevant, right? And, but this gamification thing is kind of a fad. Like, where's the ROI in that? Who needs gamification, right? It's a distraction, again, to our employees and only fad chasing enthusiasts talk about gamification. So if you see this pattern, you kind of feel that, hey, maybe the next, the next little slide is that, hey, duh, every organization needs a gamification strategy or a human focus design strategy, right? So, so I think this is becoming more and more relevant and it's important to, to, uh, to be there at the right time. You know, companies who don't take these things seriously at the right time become irrelevant later on or lose, up, lose big opportunities to, their, to the competitors. Like, you know, the first one, Amazon saw that as an opportunity. Everyone else saw it as a fad. And, you know, Amazon is pretty formidable these days. Cool. So um, right, right now, luckily, it is being more recognized. You know, Gartner... Uh, the research firm predicts that 70% of Fortune 500s will use gamification um, in 2014. So that's a good thing. Except they also predicted that 80% of those gamified apps will fail due to bad design. That's not as encouraging, right? So, so why is that? And I, have, I think there's a few reasons for that. First of all, whenever something becomes a buzzword, there's a lot of agencies and individuals coming out and calling themselves experts at it, whether it be SEO, social media, cloud computing, big data. There are obviously legitimate people, but there's a lot of people who just come out and say, you know, I, this is the future and I'm the expert and, you know, do that personal branding stuff. And unfortunately, the only thing they know how to do is what we call the PBLs, points, badges, leaderboards. If you hire them, all they're like, hmm, okay, let's see where we can put the badges on your side. Let's see where we can put the points, all right? And this is kind of like social media marketing about four or five years ago. During that time, there's a lot of uh, people coming out calling themselves experts that can talk about the future about social media, like, oh, you know, it's the future. Everyone is a publisher. It's amazing, right? But when you hire them, all they know how to do is create a Facebook fan page and a Twitter profile at the time. And we all know that real social media marketing is not simply creating the profile and the Facebook fan page. It's more about how to engage people, how to create value, right? It's, it's much deeper than that. And luckily, some, a lot of companies do it correctly, and that's why nowadays it's seen as a given that you have to do it. The last reason why I think a lot of gamified apps fail is because people like to begin with game mechanics, uh, which are all the, the fancy stuff, right? It's, it's very the interesting things. It's like, it's like, hey, look, game mechanic, it sounds cool. We love to see the list of 65 game mechanics, appointment dynamics, all those things, right? And I think that's doing it backwards, right? You really want to focus on the core drives instead. So if you take an example of a bad game designer, a bad game designer would think, hey, well, in my game, we probably need stores. Where can they go? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, how about monsters? Yeah, of course we need monsters. Oh, yeah, we need cows, too. Oh, yeah, we need friends to uh, fertilize the, 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 the crops, right? And we, yeah, we should add some angry birds to it. How about some candies that people can tr crush word, and, and little word tiles, right? Those are all great elements, right? Because games, you know, that will make my game very successful. And what you, what you see here is that a game can have all the quote-unquote right game elements, but still be extremely stupid or boring, right? And if you think, of, think about it, every single game out there has quote-unquote game elements in them, every single one of them. But most games still suck. Most games are boring, and most games are financial losers, right? Only, only a few very successful games are successful. So it's very naive to think that, hey, once I take these game elements that are also found in failed games and I put it in my product, put it in my company, we'll be super successful, right? That just doesn't make any sense. And so we want to, we want to make sure these games are well-designed to achieve the status of what I call winning and addicting. So let's look at a point of a good game designer. Instead of thinking what game elements should I use, a good, gamer, good game designer starts off thinking, how do I want my users to feel do I want them to feel inspired? Do I want them to feel proud or even scared from uh, horror games, right? 
And once you understand how you want users to feel, um, that's when you figure out, okay, so what are the game mechanics, game elements that can help achieve the type of feeling, engagement, and, and motivation. So quick, quick summary here. The good game patients not start with the game elements, but start with our core drives. Those going game elements are only a means to an end, not an end in itself. So this is where I, uh, I introduced my uh, Octalysis framework. So this is a framework that I created to help people design gamification better. And it's really based on motivation and eight-core drive. And this is a busy screen. Don't worry. We're going to uh, dig really deep into this and understand it better. But you can see in the middle, there's the eight-core drives, which we'll talk about. And on the side, there's all these little mm -hmm. game mechanics, game elements that you can use but don't have to use, depending on what you're doing. All right, so let's, let's focus on the center eight-core drives. So I believe, through my framework, that everything you do is based on one or more of these eight-core drives. And this is derived through a lot of um, game studies, and these are what makes games actually engaging. There's a hidden ninth core drive. We don't have to go there. Um, of course, that sometimes becomes a question. But most of the time, it's these eight core drives that you, uh, that you focus on. So let's, let's look through them. The first core drive is epic meaning and calling. And this, this is basically saying you're doing something because it's something bigger than yourself. And this is why people uh, contribute to Wikipedia. They don't do it to, to make money, as you all know, but they don't even do it to, uh, to uh, update their resumes. They do it because they are protecting humanity's knowledge, right? Something much bigger than themselves. Core drive number two is uh, development and accomplishment. And this is the feeling that, hey, you know, I'm leveling up, I'm growing, I'm achieving mastery, right? Feeling good about your accomplishment. And this is where a lot of the points that is leaderboards fall in, right? It's points, oh, I'm kidding, my, my, my points are growing, I'm getting a badge, I feel accomplished, right? Um, but just because you have a badge doesn't mean you have this core drive, right? Um, if you go on a website and you click on a button, and then it, suddenly a pop-up shows up and says, da -da -da, congratulations, you just got my, put down my first button badge, you're not going to be excited. You're not going to feel like accomplished, right? You're going to be like, this is pretty lame. Like, what else is there? Like a scrolling down badge? Like a click on the About Us page badge? You know, just not very, you know, very, very exciting. But if you do something that uniquely you uniquely qualified for you utilize your creativity you solve problems right and then you get a badge a achievement symbol to show to to represent it you feel proud of it and of course you want to show people that and you know achievement symbols come in the form of badges you know belts black belt white belts trophies you know all types of things but you the key is what it represents and this is kind of like the military right this is where pretty much where badges came from if you join the military and then on day you get a badge on your chest that says join the military badge and the next day you get another badge on your chest say survive my first day badge and then made my first friend in the military badge made my fifth friend in the military badge you're not you're you're not going to want to show anyone that you're going to be ashamed of all these badges on your chest right you're going to be hiding them but if you actually uh, committed an act of bravery of valor you risked your life to save your teammate and because of that you have a badge on your chest to represent it. You feel proud of it. You want to show it to as many people as possible, as long as you don't look like an asshole. Um, and, so, and so whenever I work with clients, I never ask them, hey, do you have badges or not? I ask them, do you make your users feel accomplished? Because you know, badges can make users feel accomplished, but they can also make users feel insulted. So again, that's, that's the core drive is more important than the game element. Third core drive is empowerment of creativity and feedback. And uh, this is like Lego. This is basically saying, hey, you give users the basic building blocks. And there's an infinite amount of ways to, for them to utilize their creativity, try different combinations, see if they like it or not, and then see feedback, and then come back, adjust it, and see it again. And that process is very, very motivating and engaging. The fourth core drive is ownership and possession, which is the concept of because you feel like you own something, you want to improve it, you want to protect it, and you want to get more. And, you know, this is the core drive that, that leads to a lot of collecting things. Like collecting things are always fun. It also is the core drive of accumulating more money. Um, also deals with things like virtual goods, virtual currencies. Also, if you customize your avatar, you know, that you feel ownership over it. It also deals with less uh, or, or more abstract things like if you spend a lot of time customizing your LinkedIn profile, for instance. And it's, or, or a system has been learning about your preferences, um, you eventually feel more ownership over it. Like, this is my profile. This is my you know, little bot that understands what I want. 
And um, so you see that a lot. Um, Core Drive 5 is social influence and relatedness, which is pretty well understood. It's just all the things that you do because of what other people think or say or do. So it's like things like mentorship, like envy, you know, but it also deals with relatedness, which are things like you know, nostalgia. If you, if you see a product that reminds you of your childhood, you have a better chance of buying it. Or if you meet someone who's from the same hometown, you know, there's a higher chance you want to strike a deal with this person. And you know, nowadays, all the, all the companies out there are trying to optimize for social, optimize for social. So that's, that's all uh, within this core drive. The sixth core drive is scarcity and impatience, which is a concept uh, that uh, you want something just because you can't have it. Um, basically, like, this is like if grapes are on the table, you don't care about those grapes. But if the grapes were just beyond your reach on a shelf, you're always thinking about those grapes. You know, are those grapes sweet? Can I have them? When can I have them? And, and, and the like, you know, and this is like, this is basically the core drive that Facebook used when it started, right? At the beginning, it's just for Harvard students. And then everyone wanted to join. It's like, okay, we're going to open up to a few Ivy League schools. And then we're going to open up to UCLA, you know, and everyone, everyone wanted to join because they couldn't. And that power of scarcity. Uh, another example is, uh, this, is, this is actually how a lot of, mobile social games monetized these days. So sometimes you would go on a game like Farmville and think, you know, this is kind of fun, but uh, I would never spend real money for a stupid game, right? And you play the game and then suddenly dangles this mansion in front of you and you're like, hey, I kind of like this mansion. Let's see what I need to do to get it. Man, I need to do 20 more hours of farming to get this mansion. That's a lot of farming, but wait, I just need to spend $5 and I can get the mansion immediately. Five dollars to save 20 hours of my time, that's a no-brainer, right? So now you're no longer spending five dollars to buy some pixels on your screen. You're spending five dollars to save your time, which, which becomes an easy choice. So again, this is what gamification does. It really changes your perception of value and, and it says, hey, you want this, you can't have it. Here's a narrow path to get there. And people say, oh, well, I guess I will pay money instead or whatnot. Cool. Next core drive is unpredictability and curiosity. Uh, and don't worry, I'm going to quit. Later on, we're going to go really deep into these eight core drives, so, so we're going to revisit them. Don't worry if you don't have them all memorized. Um, this, is, this is a constant core drive that says, hey, because you don't know what's going to happen next, you're always thinking about it. And uh, this is obviously heavily used in the gambling industry. Right? Even though you, are, you know you're statistically screwed um, by the casino, that's how they make so much money, right? It's still like, hey, maybe I will win, maybe I won't lose. What if I really know? Just, just, just that process of not knowing what exactly will be the outcome right now makes it engaging. And this is also used in all types of campaigns, like when there's a lottery system or a sweepstakes, this is the core drive that backs it. And there's a lot of um, scientific research behind this core drive, the most famous being the Skinner box. So the Skinner box is basically an experiment done by you know, Skinner, uh, where he put an animal in a box, and, the first, and there's a lever in the box. The first experiment is that whenever the animal presses the lever, food comes out. And so what you'll see there is that the animal will press the lever until it's no longer hungry because it doesn't need food anymore. It makes sense. But when you change the mechanics to the point where whenever the animal presses the, le the lever, food may or may not come out and sometimes to come out, what you'll see is that the animal constantly pressing the lever regardless of it's hungry or not because it's just like messing with its head. Oh, will it come out, will it come out, will it come out, right? And you see that in a lot of behaviors in real life and, and people too, right? Skinner box. Now, a lot of, there's a lot of misconception on the Skinner box. A lot of people say, oh, you know, the points badge leaderboard, you know, gamification, that's just like putting people in the Skinner box. And that's actually incorrect because the Skinner box is actually, actually appeals to this, the unpredictably core drive when points badges, leaderboards, stuff like that appeal to other core drives. But a lot of people think, oh, well, it changes behavior, so it's like Skinner box stuff. Um, that, that's a misunderstanding. The eighth and final core drive is loss and avoidance. And, uh, you know, this is pretty straightforward. It's just you're doing something because you want to avoid a loss, right? You don't want something bad to happen. And, um, you know, you go to a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of people go to work because of this core drive. You know, it's like I'm going to work because I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to lose a paycheck. And so, and this, this is the eighth core drive. So, and we're going to go into more of that detail too. So, these Are eight core drives. Yes. Um, two questions from the chat, uh, and I know that, you know, uh, just a quick time check, we're 40 minutes in, so, if, you know, spend whatever time you can on, on these questions. The first question is about motivation, so intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. How does that play into this framework? There's a TED talk about how extrinsic motivation kills innovation. 
So any thoughts on that? Oh, <laughs> there we go. Cool. So this, um, the A-chord drives are organized on an octagon shape for a reason. The left, the left side ones are the left brain core drives that deal with more logic, calculations, ownership. The ones on the right side, uh, you shouldn't see this slide yet. Um, <laughs> I just jumped ahead because you asked the question. The right brain core drives are um, more about social, creativity, and the likes, right? And previously, when I was thinking about the framework, I was like, well, all of them are core drives, right? So they're by nature pretty intrinsic. But when I dug further, I'm like, hey, there is a tendency, not absolute, but there's a tendency that left brain core drives are more about extrinsic motivation. So, you know, you're, you want to get something. Ownership, right? You want to accomplish a goal, right? You can't have something. Those are things that you really want to, want to achieve, want to get. There's something that we want to obtain. Whereas the right brain, those are intrinsic motivation, things that you just enjoy doing, right? You don't need a reward, a goal, to use your creativity to play with a paint, right? You don't need a reward to hang out with your friends because it's just fun by itself. And then you don't necessarily need a reward to, to be in the suspense of unpredictability, right? It's just like, hey, what's going to happen? That feeling itself is motivating for a lot of people. So, so when you think about this, you know, when you think about extrinsic, it's usually useful. And it's, it's easy to design. Say, so, hey, if you do this, I'll give you this reward, right? Or you can't have this reward, right? Um, the problem is that because of its extrinsic, the activity itself is still boring. The activity is still, you know, if you're shoving, if you're shoving, shoving a feces, right? You know, it's, it's a sucky job, and if it says, hey, if you shove like 10, you know, 10 kilograms of feces, you'll have this, you'll have this uh, chocolate cake. I don't know if the chocolate cake actually sounds good in that scenario when you're shoving feces. It's like, you, you, would, you, would, you would be more motivated to shove the feces, but shoving feces still sucks, right? So a lot of people will say, hey, when you design something, try to design, try to make shoving feces itself more fun. All right, and, and so, so you want to really think about intrinsic, and, and the dangers of extrinsic, like you mentioned, is that, when people are doing it for the reward, when you remove the reward or you make it less, then people become a lot less motivated. So this is like if you give employees like a huge bonus check this year, like they're excited, they're happy. Then next year, you give them a small bonus check. It's still a bonus check. It's still more than what they should have been uh, getting. But then now they're like, this is stupid, this crap. I don't want to work hard anymore, right? That's the danger of extrinsic motivations because they are not doing it for the fulfillment of the work, but they're doing it for the reward. And so that, and, and you know, gamification, we understand that the best way to make people stop doing something that they're doing for free is to first pay them to do it and then stop paying them to do it. Or just say, I'll pay you $10 to do this. And then later on, it's like, yeah, I think I'm just going to pay you a dollar to do it. Then they're going to stop doing it altogether, even though before they just did it uh, for free. So that's something you have to be very careful about in crafting your gamified experiences, and sometimes when you change that perception that, you know, it, it sometimes screws things up forever, right? If you pay this employee a huge bonus check, every year after that, you're kind of screwed because whatever you do, as long as it's lower than that big bonus check, they feel, like, less motivated. So, so you want to really, we really want to anchor the expectations and perception in. Also, if you guys have noticed, um, the top core drives are more positive and inspiring. I call them white high gamification core drives. And um, and the bottom ones, they're more, um, you know, they're they're more manipulatey, and I call them black game occasion core drives. So if you're always doing something because you're part of a bigger meaning, you're changing the world, right? You're helping people, and you're also you're, you're you're improving, you're accomplishing something, you're achieving mastery, you're using creativity. It feels very very good. You feel like you're in control of the, your life and your situation. But if you're always doing something because you are avoiding a loss because you can't have something or because you don't know what's going to happen next, it's still going to be extremely powerful and motivating you to do the activity, right? But it sometimes leaves a bad taste in your mouth. So white hat gamification, again, it makes you feel powerful. And black gamification is like, oh, I can't control myself. I have to do this, right? And the, and the issue is that when you're in black hat gamification and you don't feel comfortable, when you can leave the system, you will want to leave the system. So that's what I believe is the problem that Zynga is facing right now. Zynga... They don't understand this framework very well, but they figured out, hey, how to use a lot of these black hat game techniques. And so they say, hey, look, if we do this, our user metrics look great. Everyone's addicted. Everyone spends a lot of money. Monetization looks great. However, because they use a lot of black hat techniques without balancing with the white hat, again, people don't feel good. So when they can leave the system, they will want to. Just like gambling, right? You're addicted to it, but when one day you actually leave it, 
you're like, I feel in control of my life. And I think this is a key reason why they're seeing stagnant results because they're focused on their metrics and Black Hat is really great at creating urgency and doing something, but it doesn't make users feel good and so they leave the system. Um, and we're going to go a little more into that, the Black Hat stuff. Uh, but just because it's called Black Hat Gamification doesn't mean it's necessarily black, bad. A lot of people voluntarily put themselves in Black Hat Gamification in order to, for instance, go to the gym more often or um, eat health, eat more carrots. And this is an example uh, that's very interesting. This is an alarm clock where every time you press the snooze button, you know, for other cultures, uh, it's the button that says, you know, shut up, wake me up 10 minutes later. It'll destroy your money. And, uh, you know, this again, this is, you're waking up because of, uh, loss and avoidance, right? Black Hat Game Case, core drive number eight on the bottom, right? You're waking up because you don't want to lose money. But it's because, but because it's for a goal that you want to accomplish. This is my goal. I want to do it. You feel okay about it. This alarm call later on upgrade into an uh, iPhone app where every time you press the snooze button, you play the developers a few dollars. So now there's a revenue model to it too, which is smarter. Uh, but again, so the key is that if, if it's the goal you want, then Black Hat Game Case is fine. It's, it, you motivate yourself to do what you couldn't do it yourself. Uh, but when people feel like, hey, this company is using this to make more money off of me, again, they will to do the actions because they, don't, they can't control themselves, but they won't feel good. So it's not good for your long-term um, long success. And so, so this is not even talking about ethics, which is very rel related to ethics, but I'm just saying if you do this too much, it's not even going to be successful for you in the long run. But it's always good to have some of that. You know, a little unpredictability is, is good. A little scarcity, a little avoidance, you know, that makes the game fun too. Cool. So once you understand these eight core drives and you understand how you want your users to feel, right, that's when you finally go out to the surrounding text, you know, what are the game elements that can improve these core drives? And maybe it's points. Like maybe we need to add more elitism or narrative into the system. Maybe we add, need to add more glowing choice. Maybe some mentorship, maybe a point dynamics. The, the key here is that it's never a cookie cutter solution. It's never that, hey, we just add these things and we'll be successful. You really want to think about how your users are feeling right now and how you want them to use it to feel. It's always a design process. You know, you're designing experience. And so once you have that framework, you can start analyzing a lot of things, right? You can look at, hey, why is Facebook engaging? Well, I guess Facebook right now, there's not a lot of epic meaning in calling to use Facebook, right? And there's not a lot of scarcity, but there's a lot of other core drives, so everyone likes to stay on Facebook. Oh, you can look at Farmville. Farmville is appealing in a different way. On Farmville, there's not a lot of meaning either. And there's very little predict, uh, unpredictable. You kind of know what's going on. You're just clicking the buttons every day. You can look at games like Diablo. You can look at Twitter. You, know, you can do all these things. And um, so before I always craft these things by hand, and recently one of my fans, my audience, my readers, uh, created a tool. So it's the Octalysis tool. So if you want, you can also go to ukaichiha.com slash octalysis.html. And there's an the Octalysis manipulation tool. Like you can put in the numbers, and it'll morph the shape to what, you're, what you like and then you can kind of see the experience flow. Cool. So that's level one of Palace. There's actually five levels, and we, we would only be able to touch a little bit on level two, level three, but mostly we're going to go back and focus on level one right now. Um, so but once you understand Octavis level one, um, now you can bring it up to the four experience phases. And basically what this means is that most companies, when they design an experience, design a product, they have you know, they think of it as one product experience, right? Which kind of makes sense, is one product, one experience. However, when it comes to motivation engagement, you know, every stage is very different for a user, right? When you use a product on day one, the, mo the, reason, the reasons why you're there is different from day 100. Even, even the features that you see are different from day 100. So you really want to think about how the experience evolves and how it still engages people. So the four phases I listed out here, is the discovery phase, which is why would people even want to start to use your product, right? It's not, and it's not just about, it's a little bit related to marketing, but it's all about attitude, right? If you just read about something on TechCrunch and you signed up, this is unpredictable curiosity. You're not, a, you're not the best user. You're just like, oh, I want to check out what it is, and okay, goodbye, right? Versus someone who says, who, who tells their friends, hey, this is the most important thing you need to use. Check it out. That's a different motivation, right? Social influence relatedness. And so, so you, this is understanding why people even start starting start this experience, and you try to optimize for that. And this is onboarding, which is how do you teach users the basic tools to play the game, right? What's the, and uh, then there's scaffolding, which is the regular journey, right? And the regular journey involves, you know, like I said, repetitive tasks more often than not. 
And but why would users want to continue to do the same things over and over again for days, weeks, months, or years? You know, you, have, you, want, you really need to think about the motivation there. And then the end game is how to retain your veteran. And a lot of companies don't design for the end game, which I think is a big mistake, uh, because your veterans are your best, you know, evangelists, your best community managers, your best monetization vehicles. The only problem is that they've been there forever. They've done everything there is to do. Why would they stay? Have you designed something for your veterans to stay? Right. Same with a company. Right. If you've been working at the same place for ten years, why do you stay? Right. Um, so you got to think about that. So for each one of these phases, you can try to think about the eight core drives and then optimize for all these phases in terms of motivation. So let's let's go into a little bit more detail in discovery, just just to make it more concrete. So for discovery phase, again, this is why people start to use your product, right? Most people use a new product or, or, do it, or start a new experience because of unpredictable curiosity, Core Drive 7, a weak one too. Um, they're like, oh, I heard about it somewhere, I read about it on the news, I'm just trying it out, right? And like I said, a lot of companies are optimized for social these days, right? Getting friends to invite others. Um, maybe, maybe, but sometimes for epic meaning calling, oh, I heard Kiva.org is good for the world, it helps the world, right? So I want to try Kiva.org because I want to make a difference or just any charity you can think of. If you're an enterprise B2B product, it's lost and avoided. Oh, my boss told me to use this product so, and I don't want to lose my job, so I guess I use this product, right? It's amazing at bottom lining activity, but it's not the most exciting motivation, right? Uh, scarcity we talked about, you know, Facebook, not allowing people to join makes them want to join. Uh, development accomplishment. Uh, I'll throw out a quick example. There's this company called Keep. Uh, they're, they're a new company, but they're relatively successful. I think they raised about $20 million. Um, and what their entire company is based on the development accomplishment core drive in the discovery phase. So what that means is that it, they're a back-end monetization platform for mobile apps. Let's say you're a game, um, you're playing this game, and then you kill this dragon. When a pop-up appears that says, congratulations, you just killed a dragon. Here's a 10% coupon to Subway. Right? And their premise is that, hey, if people feel like they, des they earned this coupon, they have a higher chance of, of using it. And that's, and that's an exaggerated example. Most of the time it's like you're doing a running app, you run 10 blocks, and then, you un and then it says, congratulations, you unlocked a coupon for a free bottle of water or something um, in, the, in the store next door, whatever it is. It's just something more relevant. But the whole point is people want to discover something because they feel like they earned it, they accomplished it. Right? They feel accomplished and therefore they want to move forward. So again, you can think through these, these core drives in all this and all four phases. Onboarding, it's definitely about a development accomplishments, making people feel smart. Most people, when you go on very complex products, you know, for personally I think Google Plus is like these products, it has a lot of amazing features, but most people go on Google Plus and it's like, well, I feel dumb, I don't know what to do, there's so many things to click on, right? there's so many items, and so, so they don't feel smart and they lose motivation and during the onboarding phase people drop out until they have to come back again because they want to use YouTube and everyone gets, gets sent there. Um, you also want to reinforce epic meaning calling, right? Say, hey, this is where the big journey begins. This is why this is so important, right? And you know, so, so, so you want to think about how to think about the A-Core in every one of these phases. Cool. So once you have an idea of how level two of passes works, now you can push another level if you want to, to uh, level three, which factors in uh, different player types. So uh, over here, I put in uh, Richard Bartle's four player types, achievers, explorers, socialized killers, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you can put in whatever you want, like marketers, engineers, or male, female, whatever you want. The key here is that is to recognize that everyone is motivated differently, right? So now here's a framework to understand, hey, maybe we, have, maybe we can understand how everyone on the left feels differently at every stage. And it's very important to think about these 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 phases because once you have no motivation in one phase, that's where people drop out, right? And you don't want them to drop out. So, so here you can kind of see, oh, it's, it's really hard to create a system that pleases everyone, obviously, but at least you can use this tool to, to try to optimize as much as you can. So you can say, oh, look, achievers, they would want to try out the product. Onboarding, they'll feel great, but scaffolding, they lose motivation, so they leave. Explorers, they'll be curious, they'll try it, but during onboarding, they lose motivation, they leave. Socializers don't even want to start. There's no reason for them to try it out. Or in the marketing materials, it, n it doesn't mention anything about socializing, so they don't want to join this at all. And then the killers might be the ones that, you know, try the product out, go through onboarding, scaffolding, and they're the ones at the end game. And they're probably like killing the news or something, or, or, or being like or showing everyone, oh, look how awesome and look how knowledgeable I am. Killers, 
the sound of grass is basically people who are competitors, people who need to look good or accomplish um, at the expense of others. So, so achievers just want to solve problems like an engineer. They don't care if other people fail. They actually want other people to succeed. Killers want to succeed, and, 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 but they want other people to fail and see, wow, this guy's so much better than me. Cool. So again, that's Octalysis level two and three. Um, and uh, we're not, again, we're not going to go very deep into it because I don't want to cover too much ground without you guys being able to do anything, like take home anything. So, so if there's one thing I want you to remember is eight-core drives, level one Octalysis. Always think of eight-core drives. And so, so we're going to go back to go deeper into those, and we're going to cover more examples and, uh, and just so it's, it's more concrete. But before, uh, before anything, it's, a, it's good to, uh, to, to apply what you've learned as much as you can. So the game you like that you, that you expressed in the beginning, right? Uh, think about which, which one of those eight-core drives really, really are in those games that you enjoy playing, right? All those games I listed, poker, mahjong, or golf, whatever, they have quite a few of these core drives in them, and you can kind of think, okay, I understand now why this was, this was fun for me, because that is these, eight, these core drives, right? So this is your first step to practice octalysis, to think about which something you already understand, you already enjoy, and think about those eight core drives. Cool. And then, of course, at this time, a lot of people say, hey, can you see the, 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 the chart again, and all that stuff, but we're going to go back to that, so don't worry about it. Um, and moving on, and we're going to uh, pause a little, to take a to one more break for you guys to write these things down and get some, some water too. Um, so next step we're going to do is we, we're going to try to make it a little bit more actionable, help, maybe use it to help solve your problem. So, so what I want you guys to do also is write down a problem that you want to solve right now. So something you want to improve and just make sure the problem, the problem can be solved through human motivation, right? So whether it's your customers buying your products or your clients, you know, liking you more, giving you gifts or whatever, employees, teammates working hard, or just yourself. I want to work out more and whatnot. Think of a problem you want to solve. I'll give you guys like a minute while I get some water, and then uh, we'll come back quickly, shortly. And feel free to share the problem that you've come up with in the chat so that we can see you know, the types of problems that we're all trying to address. Cool. I guess uh, I said a minute, but we were there's there's still quite a few things to cover, and and I still want to give you time, enough time to answer. So let's move on. Um, cool. But just keep that in mind. We're going to come back to this later too. Cool. All right. So the next thing is just making it more concrete, right? All these eight core drives sounds great, but it's like, well, do I see those in the real world? Like, how does it apply, right? It's still very abstract. So I just wanted to bring a lot bring a lot more examples so you see how. Uh, it comes to effect. All right, so, so let's, let's do that. An epic meaning and calling, this one is usually the most abstract for most people. A lot of companies will tell me, hey, you kind of, you know, we're just a tool company. We're just an app, right? We're functional. There's no epic meaning and calling. We're not changing the world and all that stuff, right? So, so what, you know, how do we add this core drive to it? So, so and, there, and there's some examples that are really great. The, the most impressive one that I've seen is this, this GPS app called Waze, left bottom. Um, Waze is a GPS app on your phone uh, that was sold to Google for a billion dollars, I think, or for 1.5. Yeah. Um, and if you think about GPS, it's something that's very functional, right? It's turn left, turn right, get to your destination. Nothing exciting, nothing fun. Just, I get, I get to your destination, right? But Waze has done an amazing job. They do a lot of other gamification stuff to it, and you know, some of them, I think, is overdoing it. But what impressed me was that they had, in, at least in the earlier days, they added epic meaning and calling to the process. So when you first sign up to Waze in the early days, they'll show you one image, and I and uh, I, I was I spent a lot of time trying to find that old image online, and it's really I, I couldn't find it. You know, it's, it's 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 gone. But basically, it's a picture where on the left side there's a huge snake monster. This snake monster is made out of a road with cars stuck on it, and this snake monster's name is Traffic. On the right side of the picture, there are little well knights, Wazers, you know, little cute characters that look like that little smiley face with shield and sword, and they're trying to work together to fight against this big traffic monster. And below there's one subtitle that says, be traffic together. Right? So, so again, this is not like a huge storyline that you have to do. It's just one image. But what it means is that, hey, when you are driving with ways, you are no longer just straining to your destination. You're helping humanity beat this monster called traffic. And no one likes traffic, right? Everyone hates traffic. 
So, and, and how Waze works is a user-generated GPS. So whenever some people drive with it, they're sharing information about traffic conditions, about, oh, there's a cop here, there's a, a trash on the ground, there's a car stuck on the side. And so when you're driving, Waze gets smarter and smarter. So it'll warn everyone, hey, avoid this, avoid that, careful, you know, do this stuff. And so, and so again, everyone's working together to beat traffic, this monster, right? And this is a higher meaning. What's interesting is that because it's a user-generated app, sometimes it's not so accurate. So it's, it's led me to the wrong place like three times before, and I was late before my meetings, which is a big deal. Uh, and, but usually, the, usually, you know, when you think a GPS, the core and only function of a GPS is getting you to the right place, right? And when something fails at its core competency, most people will say, this is a piece of crap. I'm going to delete it, right? The amazing thing about Waze and about Epic Media and Calling is when this happens to people, right? They got taken to the wrong place. Instead of deleting the app, a lot of people say panic and they say, oh, crap, the map is broken. I need to go fix it, All right? How powerful is that? When you fail at your core company to your customers, instead of complaining, telling everyone about it, they're scared of it. Oh, well, we don't want anyone else to find out. We want to fix it as quickly as, as we can, right? And this is the power of epic meaning calling. It's no longer about what I want, what I can get out of it. It's more I believe in this ideal. I believe in this vision. And I, and, and I want to protect it, right? And that's really powerful. Um, we talked about epic meaning in Wikipedia and uh, you know, Folded. Obviously, you're playing a game to solve cancer, right, or solve, solve AIDS. So that has higher meaning. Pain Squad, uh, I, I kind of want to quickly go through that. So Pain Squad is an app for uh, children with cancer in, in, in hospitals. So little kids, right? And you can imagine when a little kid is in a hospital, they're not very motivated. They feel lonely. They feel they're in pain all the time. They think no one likes them. You know, it's just a very depressing process. And they also need to keep track of a pain journal uh, for, for a four-week program. So every day they need to record down that, oh, I felt pain at this time, and it was very severe and all that stuff. And you can imagine that when you're, when you're a kid in the hospital and cancer and pain, you're not very motivated to write on these journals. The other problem is that whenever there's one missing data, in the, like if there's one day the child does not record the data, the entire data set is useless. It's, it's pointless. So they created a little app called Pain Squad, and when you, when you open the app, it, it shows a video of, of welcoming to the Pain Squad, which is a secret police unit that is trying to capture this, this thing called pain, right? And you are a secret agent, and you're trying to, so whenever you detect pain somewhere, you've got to record it into the app. And they also show videos of real, well, not real police people, but, you know, real people from, from a police uh, TV shows saying, hey, you're doing awesome at this pace. You're going to be captain soon, or, you know, chief's going to be real proud of you. You know, it's just, it's just giving you a feeling that, hey, I'm no longer just a sad little kid in a hospital that no one cares about. I'm part of the secret police force. It's something bigger than myself. And so they feel motivated. They feel like they're into it, and they want, and they want, and, and it shows tremendous results in making sure all the kids are reporting all this stuff because now they feel important. They feel relevant. Good. Again, another example of epic meaning calling. Another thing about epic meaning calling is what I call elitism. When you feel like you're part of this group, right, you want to do something that represents this group. So, so one example I, um, here is, is Apple. Apple has done a really good job building that elitism. I have friends coming to me to, and say, you Kai, I want to buy the next iPhone. And I'm like, but you don't even know what's in the next iPhone. It, 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 it might even suck, right? And he's like, I don't care. I'm going to buy the next iPhone, right? So, so what happens here is that people self-identify as an Apple person. And so they need to start doing what Apple people do, right, which is buying iPhones and buying MacBooks. And, of course, you see them being a little bit snobbery. My, I'm guilty of that, too. When people are stuck on some problems, like, oh, well, you have that problem because you use a PC. I have a Mac. I, don't, I usually don't have this, this problem, right? And it's just being a jerk. And this is why this picture is funny for some people. It's like, it's like some guy with a PC, like, well, can your Mac do this? Ha-ha, I don't think so. Ha-ha, you know, it's like... It's just like, because um, they, usually, they usually remember someone uh, showing, saying that, hey, can your, can your PC do this? No. Um, again, if this is interesting, this is because of relatedness. Remember I, um, an experience that, that ties to it. So people, again, when people see themselves as Apple people, they'll do this, right? And they will do, do whatever Apple people do until they feel like the Apple vision is no longer a vision worth believing in. So if they do something screwy with the privacy, they're like, oh, Apple is the evil empire. We don't want to do anything with it anymore. That's when that, that's when that epic meaning falls through. And if you think about the most famous Apple ad, 
maybe besides the Think Differently, is the one that's about 1984. Um, not sure how many of you outside the US know about it. I think a lot of people know about it, right? That ad really turned Apple around, that commercial, right? Um, and if you think about it, it's not about specs. It's not about Apple computer, you know, this many RAM, like color screen, all that stuff. It's just, it just, it's about ideal. It's because of Apple's 1984 will not be like the novel 1984, right? Again, they're building an epic meaning and calling into the process. And, you know, other products of elitism, um, for example, is like Kiva.org will say, hey, let's have a competition between the Christians and the atheists, right? See who donates more money. And the Christians are like, well, we believe in a, in a loving God and we believe in, in, in generosity, so, so we obviously want to donate a lot to Kiva. And the atheists are thinking, well, we, we want to prove that you don't need to believe in a God to be generous to fellow human beings. So, so both of them represent, it's, it's not about what they gain themselves anymore. It's about a higher vision, a higher purpose, and they both act based on that. Cool. So um, again, Core Drive 1, I spent a little bit long time, longer be, just because it's a lot uh, a lot more abstract, but I'll move faster with the other core drives. Um, number two is development accomplishment. And uh, again, feeling that you, you're, you're achieving. The most famous example, quick one, is the LinkedIn progress bar, saying that you're only 85% a human because, because you only filter your profile that much. The interesting thing about the LinkedIn progress bar, it is learned from games, is that it only took two hours to code, but increased your profile completeness by 55%. Which is amazing because LinkedIn's value is pretty much the same as how much information you give it, right? If you don't fill out your profile, it's useless. And, um, and so that's, that's important. Um, Nike Plus, a lot of you know about this. Um, it's basically, Nike's a shoe company, and it's trying to figure out, well, wearing a shoe doesn't really make people feel accomplished, right? So how can we get them to be more engaged? How do we make running more fun and more satisfying? So they introduce all the Nike Plus stuff, Nike Fuel Band, to make you feel like, Nike is not just a shoe company, it's a running company. It, it helps you a company through your life. And what's important here is that because it tells you if you hit your goals every day, how fast you run, if you increase your speed, people feel growth and accomplishments, right? Because health is a long-term thing. Usually, you know you're running because you'll get healthier, but you know, it's just like you don't feel, every time you finish running, you don't necessarily feel like, hey, I got healthier, right? Not necessarily. So showing short-term uh, benefits and gratification is better um, it motivates people more than long term. eBay. Uh, eBay is one of the earliest and most successful e-commerce game case example. If you think about a generic e-commerce site, it's not necessarily intuitive to have like a competitive bidding system, like a feedback system, right? There's the yellow star certificate you can earn when you have 50, 10 feedback and then 50, right? And the, all the feedback score. But what's even more amazing and interesting about eBay is that when you buy something on eBay, you didn't just buy something, right? You felt that you won. And sometimes you maybe, yeah, sure, maybe you overpay, you pay like 10% more than what you would otherwise pay, but at least you beat those 10 other bastards that were bidding against you, right? You feel like you won. And this is, and all that stuff added together is makes people feel like, hey, eBay is so addicting, right? Selling and buying on eBay, you know, what's going to happen, right? It's, it's a competition. There's more game, it's a game-like feel inside of it. So companies are like, well, we don't, we don't believe in game occasion. We don't believe in any of that stuff. That's a fad. And you're like, well, wait, look, eBay is like, eBay is like a Fortune 200 company now, I think. Uh, of course, half of that is from PayPal, so let's avoid 500 at least, right? It's, it's because of game mechanics, because of gamification. It's just, it just wasn't called that back then. And, um, and so it's something useful. Twitter. Twitter, most people remember Twitter's biggest innovation being the 140 characters limitation, which is scarcity, code right to six, um, or five. Um, six, sorry. Um, the... Um, the key thing here is a lot of people also forget that another innovation that Twitter did was that uh, it, it created the one-way follow, right? Back then, social networks were, two, were two-way follows. You know, I add you as a friend, and you accept we're both friends now. But for Twitter, you can follow, a million people can follow me, and I don't have to follow any of them back, which means that it's more of an accomplishment to get followers, right? I am cool. That's why they follow me. And this is why, out of all the other social networks, this is the one where celebrities like Ashton Kutcher will say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to beat CNN getting into a million followers, right? And CNN's like, okay, let's do it. And then Ashton Kutcher wins. And uh, again, the key about this is accomplishment. You actually feel accomplished when you get more followers instead of just, oh, I added 1,000 people and they accept it, so now I have 1,000 friends. Not, not the same. Empowerment of creativity and feedback. Again, this is the concept of using your creativity, solving problems, seeing feedback. And this is why... Um, 
chess is interesting, and it's been a long, long-standing game, right? Because there's just there's a, a, literally like an infinite amount of combinations and different types of strategies. You're always you're always seeing feedback. You're always seeing what's going on, and that's engaging, right? Uh, but there's also things like Minecraft. You know, a lot of people are playing Minecraft now, like, like the digital version of Lego. You build your world, use your creativity. On the left bottom, there's a simulation. Of a, of, a, of a factory operation, right? So you're like, hey, I can choose to put my budget here, fix this problem, hire these employees, do all this stuff. It's utilize your creativity, it's fun. This also deals with a lot of a, um, um, crowdsourcing stuff like Kaggle. Kaggle is like, hey, we're gonna put problems on the internet and people can solve it if they want to and we're gonna start, try, to, try to, you know, just like fold it, right? And people feel like, hey, this is, this is, this utilize my creativity, this is fun. Um, Twitter, we talked about scarcity, right? When you have only 140 characters, you have to use your creativity to figure out how to say the most awesome thing within 140 characters, and people that engages people too. Um, this is a this is a game called StarCraft, and it's one of the most successful, long-lasting games ever. A lot of people ask me, hey, you know, games, you know, don't aren't games like pretty short? The lifespan of a game isn't that pretty short? Most, and it's true, right? Most games people quit within three to eight months. But that's because, if you remember my framework level two, that's because they did not design for the end game. StarCraft designs for the end game very, really well. And so they launched, I think, in 1998. And in 2011, 12, when they launched StarCraft two, everyone was still crazy about StarCraft one. Um, in fact, every few years, I get more friends saying, hey, you, you want to play StarCraft, StarCraft again? And I'm like, I, I'm like, hey, I quit it four years ago. I was like, and then I get second to you again. Um, and so StarCraft is so successful, not only because no, well, it, it's fine. Well, part of it, Korea made it a full-time professional sport. Like, there's three channels, TV channels, that just show professional pros playing each other. There's full-time professional players. There's also full-time professional commentators of this game. But the reason why this is long-standing is because it's empowerment of creative feedback. It's evergreen content, right? If you remember my framework, it's on the top, which is white hat, and it's also on the right, which is uh, intrinsic motivation. That's always a good place to be in. Now, Farmville... I like to make Farmville a lot. I think Farmville, most people play Farmville for reasons, for bad reasons, but here's a good reason why I think people play Farmville. Um, some people, once they have enough money and all this crops, right, they start to create art for their farms. Like this guy planted the Mona Lisa on his farm, and this guy made, I think that's pretty creative, you know, that someone gets to create Super Mario. Some guys say, hey, why don't I create a QR code with my farm? And I think that's, you know, those are really creative things, and I think that that's Core Drive 3, and that's a fun way to play a game. Um, different examples, like car companies these days, they're always trying to help you drive more, more efficiently with your car. You know, Tesla, people, my, my Tesla friends are all like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm playing, I need to make sure I'm always driving the perfect balance, right? So, so a, lot of a lot of cars have these dashboards right now showing, hey, you're in control. If you speed up, it, it, your, your metric goes up, you slow down, it goes down, and you can constantly see feedback. You're, you're empowered to control the situation and see feedback immediately. Well, uh, piano staircase. So they're trying to get people to go on stairs more instead of going on elevators. So they turn the stairs into a piano keyboard, a piano uh, staircase. So when people walk on it, every different notes play. So what you see is people like to uh, jump on the staircase because they want to play in sound. Like, dun, 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 like just play different sound combos. And you, again, feedback, you hear the sound and you can change it. You can change your actions, produce different sounds. So that's interesting. And they got 66% more, per more people to use staircases. Cool. Ownership and possession. Um, basically, again, this concept of because you feel like own something, you want to protect it, improve it, and get more of it. Um, one of the uh, key examples is collecting stamps, right? Collecting stamps is always fun. You know, Farmville, collecting virtual goods, great. And um, on the right top, this is a, comp this is a game company called Geomon that I was an advisor for. They got sold to Yahoo, and, apparent and uh, sadly, Yahoo turned to shut it down, so you can't play it anymore. But this is a game where it's like Pokemon Capture Monsters. But you go around, and the monsters you capture are based on your physical environment. So next to your river, if you're physically next to your river, your iPhone knows that, and you can capture water monsters, or go to mountain to capture water mount or mountain monsters. And some kids, and and kids just want to, and grown-ups too who play this game, really want to collect more and more monsters. So kids would go to the beach to, to collect the dolphin monster and all that stuff. Uh, we talk about avatars, right? When you customize your avatars to look like yourself or your alter ego, whatever it is. Um, you feel more ownership over it. So now you're more engaged in the process. It's harder for you to quit the game when you do that. Uh, McDonald's Monopoly game is also one of these earlier gamification examples in marketing, right? Um, so 
it's basically it says, hey, if you play, by playing the game, the way to play the game is to buy hamburgers. And when you buy, back, buy hamburgers, you'll get all these properties randomly. And the goal is to collect all these properties, right? And so here's the collection set, the game mechanic called collection set, where once you collect all of it, you want, you can, um, you know, you can get a huge prize. So people will come back and eat burgers and eat burgers just so they can play the game more and collect it. And people are willing, even willing to spend real money to buy parts of the reward, which is crazy because it's not even the reward, it's buying a component of the reward. Um, remember I just talked about Geomon? So Geomon does something with a collection set. They have what you call the four season deers. You know, you can tell four different seasons right there. And the key about those season deers is that you can only capture that deer at, the, at that season. So you can only capture the summer fire deer on sum, in summer. And it's kind of awkward, like, if you have two or three of the four season deers, but not all of them. So when you have two or three of them, you automatically want to finish the collection. You want to complete it. The only problem is that, hey, sometimes you have to wait three months or six months even to wait for that season. So players who play this game are crazy about getting the ones they don't have. So they're, so they're willing to spend real money and pay and all that stuff just to complete their set. And these gears aren't even that powerful in the game. It's just, it's just people want to finish collecting. Yeah. So number five, social influence and relatedness. And again, um, there's a few examples again, about uh, mentorship and group buying, group quest. There's a few different game mechanics. Uh, LinkedIn. It does something where I'm sure a lot of you have seen that now. It says, oh, 37 people have viewed your profile. Click here to see who, right? You care about how many people have viewed your profile uh, partially because you like social influence, right? You want to see, hey, or, or, am I important? Do people care about what I'm doing, right? <clears throat> On the right bottom, this is another company I, uh, I advise for, Kaplek.dj. It's saying, hey, you can listen to music, but you know, how can we make it more fun? How can we make it more social? So now people join into a little room. It's like a club. There's a you know, one of your one like you can be a DJ and you play music and everyone can click on button and say we want to dance. So now you feel like, hey, I'm not just listening to music by myself. I'm playing music to a bunch of people, or I'm listening to music with a bunch of people, and I can see if people around me like it by see how the, by seeing if they, if they dance or not, and you know, thumbs up, thumbs down of the music and or of of this DJ. Um, so I have a list of like about a hundred game techniques out there. Uh, scatter on the internet so people, it's kind of like a game for my audience for them to capture. So, so I have numbers attached, but game technique number two is group quests, right? And in games, we see, there's a lot, we see that there are quests where you can only accomplish by having a group of people do it, right? World of Warcraft, you have sometimes you have quests that only if you have 40 players can you accomplish the goal. So that has been around in games for a long time, and only more recently it has come and been adopted into companies and business like Groupon, right? Beginning of Groupon, nowadays not that anymore. It's like, the, here's an amazing 50% discount, but you can only get it if you get 100 other people, or yeah, if you get 100 other people to sign up too. And once 100 people get there, then everyone gets a great deal. It's a group quest. Kickstarter too, right? So these things have been found in games for a very long time, and, mo and only in recent years it's been brought to the business world. So again, there's so many more of these gems in games that are unexplored, unadopted, and you know, obviously Groupon is a little controversial in some of the things it does. But, uh, but, but overall, the model itself truly drives motivation. Uh, mentorship. This is something really interesting, and, and it's, it's a slightly longer. We have, we're short on time because of some questions, I think. But, um, but uh, let me quickly go through this. So this is a game called uh, Parallel Kingdoms, and they're a very small company, but they make millions of dollars, very successful. And you can see the graphics aren't that great, right? It's just like you're, you're ahead floating around fighting monsters. There's no fine graphics, which is a key thing. Games aren't fun because of very powerful graphics. Some games have amazing graphics. People don't play it. Some games have almost no graphics or crappy graphics, and a lot of people play it. So it's always about the core drive. It's not about graphics. Um, but I plan to play this game for about two hours to figure out what game mechanics they use, you know, do some research on it. And 10 minutes into the game, I got a message that said, hey, so-and-so user is, has been assigned to be your mentor. He will show up, or he'll message you when he logs in. I'm like, oh, okay. So the guy shows up, and he messages me. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. I don't care about the game that much yet, so hey, what's up? And then he just started giving me a lot of these like, items, like helmets and shields and swords that I couldn't get myself. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. This is such a high-level shield. Amazing, right? I feel excited. And then, then I'm like, wait a second. He just gave me all this free stuff. I can't quit now because I'd be such a disappointment. If he just gave me this stuff and I just quit, then he'll feel like he wasted everything, right? So I just said, oh, okay, I guess I should stay out for a little longer. So then he, then he started like taking me to different dungeons, killing monsters, and, and, and these are, I'm like a level one. I'm like 
trying so hard killing these monsters, I couldn't do it, and he's like killed everything in one hit. I'm like, wow, I want to be like that one day. Right? And this is, the part, this is the thing about Envy. Even though I don't care about the game and I plan to quit an hour after, when you see someone do something easily that you couldn't do, that you have to spend a lot of effort on, you automatically feel like, hey, I wish I could be like that at one point. And then, then I realized, hey, he's spending an hour, an hour just helping me go through low-level dungeons. Like, he's level 40. You know, he doesn't get anything from these places. He's, he's investing so much in me that, of course, I can't quit the game, right? I'd be huge let down, right? So, so I stayed on the game. I played more, and, and I played for a lot longer than I should have. Um, remember I said I was planning to play for two hours? Let's just say I stayed on for about two months. <laughs> so, so mentorship and social influence, that's very powerful, right? It keeps people engaged. Yep. So, you know, I, I keep these little slips of paper just so when, when I send out the deck, it's easier for you guys to, to see what, what I talked about. Um, works in sales. This works in sales environments too. Um, live ops has a, is a call center, and they're trying to get people to call more and also close more sales. So they added a traditional PBS system. Unfortunately, a lot of these examples in the market are PBS. Some are done better than others. But they really show your conversion rates, right? 34%, how many calls you've made. They show you your stats, and your, and your peers can see them. And when you, see, when you know that your peers can see your stats, you want to look at You're working harder because you don't want to look like a loser. So, and what we see there is that they reduce call time by 15%, very tangible, right? And also increase your sales by 8 to 12% just by adding a system. And uh, very powerful. Cool. Here's an impatience. Um, this is the concept that you want something because you can get it. Uh, let me just go through a couple quick examples. Um, and because we, we have, a, we have a, uh, an interesting video to show quick, shortly after. Um, Wood.com um, is a carbon site that utilizes two core drives severely. One is um, scarcity and patience, the other is unpredictability. So Wood.com is an e-commerce site sold to Amazon for a billion dollars. Every day you go on to, go on to it, they, um, they give you one really cool product on a great price. But the problem is that, especially in the early days, when you go on to Wood.com at 4 p.m., it sells out. You know, crap. Then the next day you go on at 11 a.m. and it's sold out. And you're like, crap, I, couldn't, I, I don't even know, I don't even get the, the, chance, the right to buy it. So what it trains people to do is that a lot of people decide to log in at 11.59 p.m. every day, refresh, refresh, refresh the page. So when it hits the midnight, the new product shows up, right? It's unpredictability. And then finally, like, oh, finally I can buy the product. And so they buy it. So that's, again, e-commerce that utilizes two core drives very, very well. Um, we talked a little bit more about... Uh, about Geomon. So in Geomon, let, let's not jump through this. In Geomon, there's, there's a really rare um, creature called the, the mozzie, which is a fox made of fire, fire fox. The only way to capture a mozzie is, next, is, is, is uh, next to a Mozilla Firefox headquarters, which means that there's only um, so many people in the world who can capture it, right? And this became so rare that everyone wanted it. And so this is a screenshot I took from a chat screen, right? This Vincent was like, I wish I had a single mozzie, then at this point in my life, I could die happy. Right? It's just really sad. Right? It's just like, because it's so rare, it's not even the most powerful one, but because it's so rare, people are desperate about it. And you don't think that most people will say, dude, get a life, right? Stop being a loser. It's just a game, right? You think that. But on, on the third line, see Valerie Fox, 18, says, me too, Vincent, me too. You know, just everyone wants this mozzie, and they're also willing to pay money you know, uh, for it. You know, I... The company received a call from a mom before that says, hey, my child is sick, has been sick for two weeks. He has nothing can make me happy unless um, he has a mozzie. And he says, you guys have it. I don't know what it is, but I'm willing to give you $20 to give him a mozzie, right? Again, scarcity. Because so few people have it, you want it, and you're willing to do a lot for it. Unpredictability and curiosity. We talked about how this is used heavily in the gambling industry. This game called Diablo uses a lot, too. It changed... It wants to increase its re, uh, repetitive play. So whenever people play the same stage, there's an algorithm that changes everything in the game and just on that stage. The doors change, the walls change, monsters change. So every time you play the same stage, it's very different. So that, that's part of their end game design. This is also a game, Diablo 2, was also a game that people played for 10, 10, uh, 10 years straight. This other core drive, I can go into that if anyone's interested. Um, this, the one on the right bottom you guys might have seen, um, this is actually a product on Microsoft. It's to train people to use Microsoft products. So it's Clipper's Great Adventure. He travels back into time, into Egypt, into different places, and he encounters problems, right? And the way to solve these problems is like, hey, turn your Microsoft Word document from vertical to horizontal. 
yay, you know, things like that. And, uh, but it makes it more fun because learning about Microsoft Word, Excel, Office, you know, it's not that fun. It's just necessary. So they just tried to, they made a game that made it more interesting. Now, I put the Super Bowl little, little tag on the right top. Um, basically, I'm not talking about the football game itself. I'm talking about Super Bowl commercials. Super Bowl commercials did an amazing job um, making everyone excited. Say, hey, who's going to be on the Super Bowl this year? They always want to watch it which is amazing because most of the time when you, you know, because even people who don't care about football, they, they still come back and uh, they, they, they turn on the channel just so they can watch the Super Bowl commercials. And this is amazing because usually when you see a commercial, you change the channel away, right? But the Super Bowl has created something so profound with, with Core Drive 7 that people turn their channels into the Super Bowl commercial, which means they, can, they have more eyeballs, they can sell it for more money. There's another thing about this core drive that's like, hey, if something's un unexpected, different from what you expect, you feel kind of, it, it, it triggers your mind too. It's like, hey, this is intriguing. So here's an example, right? If I asked you, what's wrong with this picture? You're like, well, this, it's wrong because Donald Duck isn't, isn't wearing any pants, right? So it's covering his, his, his privates, right? That makes sense. But if I show you this picture, say, what about this one? Like, well, that's, yeah, that's Donald Duck. I see him all the time. And you're like, wait a second, something's weird here hey, Donald Duck never wear pants, right? So when he doesn't have a shirt on, why does he cover his bottom? That makes no sense at all, right? So, so that's like, oh, it's different from what you expect. You see it, but you don't see it. And then you're like, oh, that engages your mind. Here's another example. Um, we'll take like a, little, a, a few seconds to try to understand this comic. It's a little complex, but see if you understand it. Water break for me. Okay. So short on time, so we're going to move quickly. So when you see this, this is kind of confusing, right? It's like, hey, look, the little boy playing with the little duck, and then the mosquito landing on the boy's head. And it's like, what? What happened to the little boy? It turned into like an alien. And you're like, what? A huge duck appeared. What is that? It's so confusing. The big duck is, the big alien duck is like blowing on the small alien boy, and then everything's back to normal. Like, that doesn't make any sense. What's going on here? And the key here to understand this is that the boy is the toy. What does that mean, right? If you understand this, then you can understand this now. So the little duck is actually the child. The boy is the, is, the, is the balloon toy. And so the mosquito punctures the little boy, the little balloon toy, and the little duck's like crying, Daddy, my toy's broken. And Dad comes up and says, all right, I'm going to fix it for you. And the, little, and the boy's back, or the little, yeah, the little boy's back, and the, the ducky child is like, yay, I'm happy again, right? Because this is so different from what you expect, you expect the child, the boy to be the child, and the duck to be the toy, and now this is reversed. It kind of intrigues your mind. It's just like, hey, this is interesting. So, so you, it's more memorable. Cool. Last quarter drive, loss and avoidance. Um, again, this is, you want to avoid something that, that, uh, that you don't want to happen, obviously. Farmville does that very well. It trains people to, to avoid not leaving the site for too long because it says, if you don't come back in eight hours in time, your crops will die, and it shows you very uninspiring graphics, and you have to click on them to clean them. It's depressing. And because of that, my mom had to wake up 5 a.m. in the morning sometimes to harvest her crops, you know, and so they don't die. Or when she travels, she has to call my cousins and say, hey, can you go on my farm? You'll help me. You know, just ridiculous, but lots of avoidance. Uh, it happens a lot in, you know, investments or poker where sometimes you, you know as a fact, almost 100% sure the other person's hand is better than yours. But you're like, oh, but I have so much money on the table. I don't want to lose all that money. So what you do, you do something irrational. You put all your money on the table uh, to try to save the money you have on the table already. And then, you know, of course, the other person has a bigger hand and you lose all your money. Uh, coupon codes, right? Coupon codes tell you, hey, this coupon is, expires February 17th. And even though you know next month you'll have the same one, March 17th, you just feel like you're losing something. The most dangerous and most powerful mechanisms in, in this core drive is what I call the sunk cost tragedy. Um, so sometimes you play a game for a long time, it's no longer fun, it's like depressing, and just like, why am I playing this? But if you quit the game, you have to feel all the loss, right? You have to feel like, oh, a thousand hours of my time just was wasted for nothing, like I'm depressed, right? And you don't want to feel that, so as a result, you rather spend your time using your powerful swords, using, spending all that million dollars or coins or whatever, right? And, and so when you're stuck into the end, which leads to more things that build, more sunk costs, more things that's like, oh, well, then I'm, instead of 1,000 hours, I'm going to give you up 2,000 hours. And you get sunk into this, this deadly spiral, and that's just really so depressing. It's just like, ah, oh, I, I can't get out of this, right? And, and usually there's ways to get out of it, but it's just something that, that's a big trap. The last example of loss and avoidance is this uh, Apple Zombies run. 
We talked about Nike Plus where it motivates you by giving, showing you how awesome you are by running. Zombies Run is an app where when you run, you put on headphones on, and it pretends that you're in this apocalyptic world where the zombie is taking over the world, and there's zombies everywhere, and, and there's a radio station talking to you. It says, hey, runner five, careful, there's zombies coming. They're, they're catching up behind you, and you hear the sound like, oh, and you're like, crap, I better run faster, or else the zombie's going to capture me, right? And, uh, and, then, you're, and then you're trying to cap, gather materials for this little town called Able Town as you run. Uh, so again, you're running because of loss and avoidance. You, want, you don't want to get caught by the zombies. It helps you run more, and, uh, and this app is quite successful. Cool. So the last uh, one, or, one or two things uh, before we end this, we wanted to really apply the knowledge that we talked about, right? Um, in terms of a pro how do you apply this? Like this bird doesn't know it's supposed to fly right now, even though it's learned how to fly. Um, so whenever I work with clients, I always start off asking them to design five things, what I call the gamification dashboard. The first is the um, business metric. You want to define what are you trying to improve, right? Some people come to me and say, hey, Yukai, we want to use gamification. What platform should we use? I'm like, well, it depends on what problem you want to solve, right? Because your problem is, is not that you don't have gamification, right? If that's your problem, then it doesn't matter what platform you use. You have gamification. You solve the problem, right? So it has to be quantifiable. It has to be something that you, that you can benchmark against. It has to be, you know, revenue, user growth, time on that, whatever it is. And that leads to game objective. Number two, users, players, demographic, you know, this is well understood. Number three are the desired actions, what you want users to do step by step, which leads to the win state in the user's mind. So the win state should always be accomplished by committing the desired action that leads to your business metric. Those three things should always be aligned. It's very intuitive, but you'll be surprised how many companies don't have that. Uh, user metrics, which are stats, are things that users keep track of. Um, towards how close they are towards their win state. You know, those, were, those are the points, badges, levels. It helps them see, oh, I'm getting closer and closer towards the win state. It motivates them. And then incentives are things where, you know, what's in your power, if you could give users everything they wanted, what would it look like? And obviously, you don't want to give users everything they want at the very beginning, but once you have that defined, you can strategically place them in different win states right, to motivate them, motivate them further and get them through. Cool. So last thing we want to show is just a quick two-minute clip and how to use Octalis to really come up with, with a solution. Um, this is Speedcam Lottery. Some people in game you know this example, but I'm going to really show you how Octalis, using Octalis, you can really create something similar. So let's actually, um, okay, let's, let's see if we can, can do this video thing here with this audio. I'm the winner of Volkswagen's Fun Theory Award. My idea was the speed camera lottery. Could we get people to uh, pay the speed limit for a fun? I really believe that fun can change human behavior for the better. And I was really thrilled to see that my idea, which started as a scribble, submitted into this competition and uh, might even become reality. would do two things. One, it would photograph uh, feeders, give them a uh, citation, uh, and that money goes in a pot. But if you're obeying the law, your picture will also get snapped, and you'll be entered into a lottery and win some of that money from those feeders. So when you see the solution, this uh, speed cam lottery, you're like, hey, that's actually a really creative, creative solution. How can I create something so creative, right? So with Octalysis, we're going to talk about how we can potentially do something like that. So if you define your problem as decreasing speeders, right, and you think about Octalysis, if you think about if there are no human intervention at all, just by nature by itself, 
there's only one core drive. There's Epic, Mini, and Calling, right? People think, oh, I don't want to be a dangerous driver, right? I sh I, it, it's, it's something bigger than this. I don't want to kill people. I don't want to hurt people. So that puts some kind of limit in how fast people are driving. Now, the problem is that most people don't equate being a fast driver to a dangerous driver. So that's why a lot of people speed. And this is where the government comes in, right? They added core drive eight, loss and avoidance. They said, oh, well, if you speed, we're going to give you a fine, right? And so, again, that bottom line is a lot of activity. Mostly, a lot of people uh, decrease their speed by a lot because of this. But, you know, as you guys know, a lot of people still speed. I'm pretty sure in every country. <laughs> um, so then they added another solution, empower enough creativity and feedback, core drive three. I'm sure you guys have been in enough, in enough countries that I know that um, – You've guys seen this little uh, banner on the side of the road that shows you how fast you're driving. It doesn't give you a ticket or does anything, but it just shows you you're going 35 miles per hour, 30, 20, right? And this allows you to see constant feedback, right? Like, hey, if I speed up, the number goes up. If I slow down, the number goes down, right? And so now you're more in control, empowerment, creative feedback. So, so now, like, if, now if you're here thinking about so what can I do more to solve this problem, how can I add more core drive? You know, we can look at this speed time lottery and think, all right, well, the speed time lottery, first of all, you can win money from it, right? So that's core drive four, um, ownership and possession, right? Hey, and, and you know, the, one, of the, one of the old guys that was interviewed is like, yeah, driving legally and earning money, that's perfect, right? That's his drive, he's wanting to earn, earn money, right? But we also talk about whenever there's a lottery system, there's unpredictable curiosity, core drive seven. And so, and so the young guy's like, well, I thought I'll win, but this is still fun. Ha, 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 right? the, the, the feeling of maybe I win, maybe I don't win, that's the engaging part. And also, we add development and accomplishment to the process. If you remember, it, when, you, when you do well, it shows a thumbs up, green thumbs up. If you don't do well, it shows red, red thumbs down. The win state is very, very clear. So people know, yay, I, I get to the win state, or no, I failed, right? So that is very clear. Whereas before the little speed metric thing, you're still always just thinking about, oh, well, what is the speed limit again? Did I win? Did I lose? It's not clear. And another one that a lot of people miss is social influence and relatedness. Like, and people are like, well, how is that social, right? It's just driving around. But if you, if you, if you notice, the speed cam lottery is on a very busy street. And everyone can see if you, want, if you got a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And most people think, yeah, I, want to, I, want, I don't want any, everyone out there to see that I'm a loser, that I got a thumbs down, I lost, and I'm illegal, right? I want everyone to see that, I'm, that I won, I'm a thumbs up, right? And so because of all these different core drives that are added into the solution, hey, look, there's a speed cam lottery, and it shows results. So with this Octalis framework, I'm saying that it is possible that you can come up with a creative solution like the speed cam lottery it's just by engaging more core drives. Cool. So that's pretty much all the things I'm covering. If, you know, we're cramming a lot of stuff in a short session, a little over time, um, and you know, there's a lot more to talk about. So if you guys are interested, there's the next step. You know, there's the advanced one-day Octalis workshop. There's Mario Herger does more on the two-day workshop about Enterprise gamification with compliance, competition, ROI, cheating, how to budget for implementation. And then, um, you know, I'm, my Octopus book is coming out Q1 2014, so you guys can check it out. Um, basically, we're the, they're the EGC Enterprise Gamification Consultancy. We work, for, we work with a lot of clients before, and uh, that concludes my talk. If you want to learn a little bit more about Octopus, you can also check out octopus.com. Cool. Um, and uh, if I have a few, I have a few minutes. If anyone still wants to stay around and ask questions, um, I'm happy to do that. Yukai, thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us to share your framework. I think I speak for everyone that this was a great workshop. I think there's a ton of information, a lot of really great examples. Um, you know, you probably can see it, but there was some good discussion in the chat and some good questions. No, I, good I, question. I, uh, I actually don't the chat. Uh, now I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, cool. so there's some good discussion while you're presenting. Um, are there any other questions, are there any questions that people want to ask from uh, in the chat who want to stay on? I mean, I think it's great. If, if you have any feedback about the session, please send it to me. I'm also going to start a conversation on the gamification community of practice um, where we can continue the conversation uh, and continue the great discussion that we've had here. Um, we will be making the slides available, and uh, as long as the technology cooperates, the uh, recording of the session as well. Um, and so I think we're, we'll go ahead and close out the session since we're over time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And Yukai, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Cool. It was a pleasure. Okay.
Take, Take care, guys. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.